Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue the series of videos on the philosophy of Jason Reza Georgiani in this group reading over his monumental text, Prometheism. This third lecture, we will cover Chapter 3, The End of History. Now, this is response to a patron's request to include this within the School of Forbidden Text. Remember, you can join us there for as little as just $2 per month. Link to my Patreon is in the video description. So, because this is a part of the school, you might have noticed that only about half of the videos are publicly available. The rest are for patrons only. So, whereas the first lecture is, of course, available for everyone on YouTube, the second lecture over Chapter 2, The End of Humanity, where Giorgiani discusses, among other very interesting topics, uh, uh, Frankenstein and um, Blade Runner. Um, that lecture is available, of course, for patrons only. So um, if you want access to about half of the chapter's um, discussions, you will have to um, make the investment of just $2 per month, the uh, price of one cup of coffee at Starbucks. If you better educational experience than you will find at really any university in the world, to my knowledge. I'm not aware of anywhere else in the world that is doing what we are doing within this school at an institutional level. And in fact, I think that the two are mutually exclusive. I don't believe it's possible to do the kind of things we're doing in this school within any sort of um, institution, especially not the kind of student loan um, sales offices which uh, universities in the United States have unfortunately devolved into. That's really all you're doing anymore on a college campus is um, having the student loan salesman <laughs> show you a catalog of um, ways to sell your soul in exchange for courses on a Beyonce that won't actually teach you anything. So the whole point of this school is to do what the colleges at this point refuse to do, and that is to study the great and, of course, a forbidden text that would never be allowed on the syllabus. And we will continue that today with the third lecture, The End of History. Now, you might have noticed that Jason Reza Giorgiani's Prometheism is a book about post-humanism, which um, in many ways details all of the um, ways that post-humanism comes about as the negation of things that we take for granted as kind of a insurpassable horizons of human experience. So this third chapter is the negation or the end of history itself, um, which of course calls into question the horizon of time through uh, to providing some very fascinating discussions of time travel. And in the second chapter, of course, it's the end of humanity. Why is it that post-humanism is the end end of human nature as we understand. Of course, chapter four is the end of reality. Why virtual reality is something far more serious than the stupid 1980s caricature of the huge gloves and the huge goggles, as we'll discuss in the next lecture, available for patrons only. So uh, we'll go ahead and start the discussion now of chapter three, and thank you for watching. So Giorgiani opens the third chapter by reminding his readers that to the extent that anyone remembers Francis Fukuyama's infamous pronouncement regarding the so-called end of history anymore, they think of it in strictly economic and political terms. This end of history was supposed to be the victory of a democracy over less efficient political forms, the uh, victory of capitalism over less efficient economic forms. Most people do not know, however, that Fukuyama later revisited this thesis but revised it with a view to the properly technological potential for technical innovations to bring about an end of history understood now in explicitly post-humanist terms. The difference is that this would be an end of history which does not simply perfect the conditions of human nature on economic or political terms as the first one might have, but instead goes beyond human nature altogether. Ultimately, this ambiguity in the phrase end of history hinges on whether one views it through the philosophical lens of Hegel or Nietzsche. Whereas the Hegelian or Marxist view of history is, of course, a certain teleological progression which cannot help but end in the egalitarian universality of a global classless society, 
Most people don't know that Nietzsche instead viewed the trajectory of history in terms of something like a, a much more politically incorrect version of Darwinian natural selection, the um, all too logical conclusion of that sort of understanding of history as unpalatable as it might be, is not at all a universalization, even of progress itself among all humans on the earth, but rather a bifurcation of the human race itself into the polar opposites of on one hand, the Superman, who had, gone, who had gone so far beyond man as to become a different, unquestionably greater species, and on the other hand, the mindless masses, who had actually dropped down to a status so far below that of man as to become indistinguishable from the robots who had already been incorporated into the machinery of production itself. Of course, any speculation regarding the end of history as just a cryptic way of asking about our future begs the question of what sort of philosophical understanding of time are we working with? But technology has already called into question the age-old Heideggerian ideal of time as the uh, fundamental ontological horizon of Dasein. For technology has introduced the possibility of artificial means of allowing speed to become faster than time itself as paradoxical as that might seem. This is, of course, just another way of talking about time travel, that which is often laughed off as the most stereotypical example of a science fiction motif which is not to be taken seriously, but merely contemplated as a source of entertainment. Giorgiani notes, however, that there actually are credible proposals to accomplish such a seemingly impossible task already worked out. On a deeper archetypal and mythological level, time travel must be understood as the ultimate victory of Prometheus over the god of time Kronos himself. Yet even this obsession with the time machine as technology misses the point that there have already been numerous accounts suggesting that time travel has been carried out in the absence of such machines. For example, the field of cryptozoology might be thought of as a mystery for which the solution for why certain animals thought to have been long extinct end up being rediscovered, the solution is simply that these were literal cases of accidental time travelers. For that matter, Atlantis's civilization is alleged to have been so radically unlike any other in the ancient world or at any other time within history, perhaps because it was populated by such time travelers who were literally ahead of their time. Of course, any question of time travel inevitably falls down the rabbit hole of the dreaded grandfather's paradox in which one has to ask whether one could travel back in time to kill one's own grandfather when he was just a kid, and whether that would retroactively cause the killer himself or herself to disappear after the conditions for that person's existence had been obliterated. In typical Giorgiani fashion, though, he insists that the deeper question here is what sort of ontology would have to be presupposed in order to allow for the possibility of such interventions into the past in order to reshape the future in the first place, especially by mere mortals like you and me rather than gods. If nothing else, such meddling in time itself would never be allowed in the universe of the omniscient um, omnipotent Zeus and the Old Testament God with which he is archetypally equivalent, but would only make sense under the archetype of Prometheus. Before we can get into all of this in greater detail, it would be useful to briefly recall how the first philosopher to rigorously develop a teleological account of history was just Hegel himself. In fact, some have claimed that the very notion of history as we understand it in modern terms was basically invented by Hegel himself. We have the ancient work by Herodotus, the histories, as something of a mistranslation of what for him were really a set of inquiries into interesting subjects. The idea of history as we understand it in modern terms is something of a logical outcome of thinking of dialectic in the way that Hegel did. That is to say, seeing progress as the ongoing underlying theme 
of so many notional phases, which do not remain static, but always end in a certain resolution of the negative tensions at work within each phase of the sprawling system of Hegel's philosophy. You need to presuppose that to have any idea of the kind of end of history, which has admittedly several different meanings. It bears mentioning, though, that Hegel saw this in highly personalized terms, seeing the underlying theme of the progress of dialectic as a certain shift from the relatively unconscious alienation of the most primitive phases of the system towards ever-increasing self-consciousness both on an individual and on a social level. The final destination of that sort of trajectory cannot help but be an end of history in which there is no longer any conflict to be resolved, for all the earlier, more basic dialectical phases will have already been worked through by that point. Marx's materialist revision of this idea differed basically through isolating the economic factors as supposedly sufficient all on their own to explain the entire movement. Now the end of history cannot help but appear as the worldwide communist revolution and the global classless society. The greatest irony, then, is that Nietzsche rejected this naive account of history not because it was too materialistic or too naturalistic, but precisely because it was inaccurate on those terms themselves. The problem really was that it made the error of assuming that the evolution of human history would follow different laws than the evolution of any other life form within nature. Basically, that nature would make an exception for us just because we're human. Politically incorrect though it might be to acknowledge, the end result of human evolution viewed from an unbiased perspective will be nothing short of the extinction of the old and the emergence of the new. Well, what exactly is the new? It's not only the positive evolution up to the Superman so far above human nature, but also the negative devolution down to the mindless robot so far below it. This is actually perfectly in line with cases of devolution which have already been proposed within nature. For example, viruses, the subject of so much discussion over the past year and a half, are actually thought by some to be the result of devolution from a higher life form which was once living, but found that it could only perfect the techniques of infecting and spreading if it became something like an accidental emergence of a technology within nature itself, if it became a bundle of executable code rather than anything like a, say, living organism. The greatest irony, then, is that this radical difference in outcomes is not to be attributed to the stupid Marxist cliché of um, each one just having different material conditions, which overdetermined each one's development. Instead, Nietzsche emphasizes that from a properly Darwinian perspective, it is precisely the same conditions which bring about both the highest and the lowest. These conditions are, of course, technological ones, as numerous passages cited by Giorgiani himself from Nietzsche's incomplete, uh, posthumously published Will to Power reveal. Why, then, does everyone in the academic industry refuse to acknowledge the uh, post-humanist elephant in the room by pretending that these themes do not exist in Nietzsche's body of work? How much more so is post-humanism an issue when the evolution of man becomes the result of willful genetic manipulations through technology rather than any vague Marxist notion of economic conditions impersonally and passively determining man's ideology from a second remove away. Bernard Stiegler, for one, has called attention to the easily overlooked problem of time which would be introduced by such interventions. The peculiarly modern phenomenon of living in the midst of outdated technologies should be seen as a disruption of the entire system of relations which might otherwise be taken for granted. In a very real sense, the phenomenon of outdatedness is evidence that technology is already traveling faster than the speed of time itself, and therefore introduces a disruption that is ontological rather than merely ontic in nature. If speed, though, is more primordial than time, it should be possible to break the time barrier with some sort of machine. Well, before you dismiss the idea of a time machine as nonsense, remember that a model has already been proposed 
particles that could transport quantum particles, though admittedly not anything larger than that, through a certain tunnel into the past. Yet the greatest implication here, Giovanni reminds us, is not traveling into the past per se, but rather accelerating the alteration of present conditions so as to bring about the singularity much sooner. When Stiegler describes time travel as a case of time literally leaping outside of itself, one should recognize this as a breakthrough in thinking far beyond Heidegger and Dasein, to use Giorgiani's own phrase, that should be given due recognition. What about the possibility of time travel without a time machine? Well, you may not have heard this before, but there are, in fact, numerous recorded accounts of people who claim to have experienced quote-unquote time slips or spontaneous momentary travel into the past or future. What is the explanation for such paranormal phenomena, though? Well, it is at least theoretically possible that such people accidentally slipped through tears or holes in the fabric of space-time. Just as one man recorded being teleported to the 19th century and then nearly being run over by a horse and buggy on an old-fashioned road. There are also accounts of people being teleported to the far future and being similarly shocked by what they saw there. If such time travel without a machine is as simple as accidentally falling into a hole in space-time, why couldn't the same thing happen to, say, animals? Well, the field of cryptozoology really should be seriously considered as the study of such accidental time travelers, not only from the vastly distant past, but perhaps even from the future. That is to say, these species thought to either be fictitious or long extinct, which are accidentally discovered, may be from either direction in time. In fact, who's to say that many of the missing persons in the USA each year did not suffer the same fate? You may laugh, but just consider all of the unsolved mysteries in which the numbers simply do not add up, such as when a finely worked gold thread was discovered inside a stone which was no less than 320 million years old, only one of many such similar cases. Even more bizarre was the case of fossilized shoe prints dating back 500 million years into the past. Who the hell was wearing shoes that many years ago? This actually does fit the hypothesis of accidental time travel perfectly well, for we've never unearthed, say, a whole city that is as old as the things I just mentioned, but rather a random item here and there, which is exactly what you would expect. No sooner than having mentioned time travel, though, have we already tripped and fallen down the rabbit hole of having to discuss the grandfather's paradox. Once again, the paradox asks, if you killed your grandfather before he could father your father, would you yourself disappear at that moment because you will have lost the conditions to have been born in the first place? But then, how could you even be there to commit the murder if you, in turn, couldn't exist at that moment either? Above all, Giorgiani warns his readers not to take the easy way out by simply proposing a bifurcation of the timeline into a set of many alternative parallel timelines, such as you find in Avengers Endgame, in which changing something in the past simply creates another parallel timeline of many. Interestingly, Giorgiani opposes this easy fix mostly because it negates any notion of free will for the resolution of possible futures into a definite pathway of a real state of affairs would be resolved mechanistically at, say, the quantum particle level, rather than by any Promethean agency as such. This sort of change to the past is therefore a misnomer, for it only negates any hope of a free agent actually intervening and changing anything at all. Perhaps even more important than the modern science fiction question of whether one can change the past is the question of whether one should change the past, a question which was properly recognized for its theological implications in the medieval era. Thomas Aquinas, for example, argued that even God himself, let alone mere man, could not change the past, for the laws of Aristotelian logic would not allow it. St. Damien objected that God is so all-powerful that he could do even that, since overturning the laws of Aristotelian logic is technically included within the set of all powers. But the properly Aquinasian response is that there would be no need for God to do so, for that would imply that God had made some sort of mistake in the past that would be in need of correction. 
something which is impossible for an all-knowing and all-good supreme being. Giorgiani notes that changing the past really implies some fifth dimension beyond four-dimensional space-time. This fifth dimension would allow a spatial relation to time itself. Would this, therefore, allow the ultimate opportunity to experience Promethean freedom, 